it might be Chicago's most overlooked treasure. A spectacular circuit of boulevards, 28 miles long. Connecting nine extraordinary parks. and dozens of historic neighborhoods. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Baer, and in this show, I'll be biking my way across Chicago using the city's network of boulevards. The boulevards are these wide, tree-lined streets that connect the city's largest parks. This system of parks and boulevards was the first of its kind in the country, imagined nearly 150 years ago. In this show, we'll find out how these boulevards came to be, and we'll explore these magnificent parks, from Washington and Sherman Parks on the south side, to Douglas, Humboldt, and Garfield on the west. These green spaces are often overlooked, but they're every bit as beautiful as Chicago's famous lakefront parks. We'll also take a new look at the old neighborhoods that emerged along these boulevards in the 19th century. Places like Bronzeville, Englewood, Back of the Yards, Lawndale, Humboldt Park, and Logan Square. Many of these enclaves have seen their share of hard times over the years. But hidden just beneath the surface, we'll find some remarkable surprises. Along the way, we'll investigate the little-known history of biking in Chicago, a city that's had not one, but three cycling enthusiasts in City Hall, that was once the bicycle-building capital of America, and where women cyclists raised eyebrows by taking up what was considered a masculine pursuit. We'll also look ahead to the future as Chicago pursues its quest to be the most bicycle-friendly city in America. We'll discover all that and more as I bike the boulevard. Biking the boulevards is made possible in part by Harris Bank. Online banking is going to be such a great step for you. Yeah, we'll know where every cent is going. That's right. You can review your account 24-7. And now that you've signed up for Harris Online Bill Pay, you can easily manage all your payments. So we can hold on to our money as long as possible. Exactly. So, do you... Yeah. I already feel like we're in a better place. Want to put yourself in a better place? Harris can help. With five helpful steps, like keeping tabs online, we help make money make sense. Major funding is also provided by Diwani Foundation through a partnership with the Pritzker Military Library, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, United Healthcare, and the Walter E. Heller Foundation in memory of Alice DaCosta, with additional support from the Coleman Foundation and Ken Norgan. Imagine a city that's so dirty, smelly, and congested that its citizens have to go to the cemetery for fresh air. Well, that city was Chicago in 1850. This gritty industrial boom town of 30,000 had just a few tiny parks. Chicagoans were so starved for green space that they packed the city's graveyards for Sunday picnics. But in the 1860s, a group of far-sighted Chicagoans offered a different vision for the city's future. They proposed a revolutionary network of parks circling the south, west, and north sides of the city, all linked together by miles of leafy boulevards it would be the first such system in America. When completed, these parks provided Chicagoans a respite from the hustle and bustle of the city, and an alternative to the unsavory pleasures of gambling dens and saloons. 
and the boulevards gave them a good way to get to the parks. You see, most roads at the time were muddy, rutted messes, hindering horse and carriage traffic. Not only were these boulevards paved with materials like gravel and wood blocks, but they featured amenities like landscaped parkways, formal lines of shade trees, and stone sidewalks. Commercial vehicles were banned, and an eight mile an hour speed limit was strictly enforced. The intent was to make the journey every bit as enjoyable as getting there. It also made the boulevards ideal routes for cyclists. More on that later, but first, let's start our journey. The boulevards form a huge semicircle around the city. I'll be following that route from the south side, through the west side, to the north side, starting here on Martin Luther King Drive, or as it used to be called, Grand Boulevard. While State Street may have been that great street for white Chicagoans, Grand Boulevard was the hub where African Americans lived, worked, and shopped in the early 20th century. At a time when segregation and discrimination kept African Americans out of the loop, they built their own downtown here in a place they called Bronzeville. Black entrepreneurs opened restaurants and stores here, banks and real estate firms, a film studio, and insurance companies. This Grand Boulevard landmark housed the first black owned and operated insurance firm in the North. At a time when most white insurers wouldn't serve African Americans, Liberty Life Insurance appealed to a growing black middle class. Nearby on State Street, a former slave built a business empire. Anthony Overton owned one of the nation's largest cosmetic firms serving African Americans, Overton Hygienic, along with a bank, an insurance agency, and a publishing company. His newspaper, the Chicago Bee, was headquartered in this building down the street. The nation's most influential black newspaper, the Chicago Defender, was based here on South Indiana. Editor Robert S. Abbott used the newspaper to champion civil rights and to encourage Southern blacks to make the journey north to Chicago. At night, Bronzeville was alive with entertainment. This hardware store was once a popular jazz club. The Sunset Cafe, later called the Grand Terrace, featured greats like Earl Fatha Hines, Cab Calloway, Bix Spiderbeck, and Louis Armstrong. Armstrong was in the house orchestra here, inspiring his Sunset Cafe stomp. The venue became a hardware store in the 1970s, but here in the office, which was once the stage, you can still see the old backdrop which stood behind the performers. Gospel music was born in Bronzeville. The world's first gospel choir was formed here at Ebenezer Baptist Church on South Vincennes by Thomas A. Dorsey, the father of gospel music. He married religious lyrics with blues and jazz sounds and called them gospel songs. Dorsey went on to form his famed Pilgrim Baptist Church Chorus. Yes, I know Jesus. Many Americans were exposed to gospel in 1934 when this church on South Wabash became one of the first in America to broadcast its services live on the radio. The First Church of Deliverance is housed in a former hat factory that was redesigned into an art modern house of worship in 1939 by Walter T. Bailey. He was the first African-American architect licensed in Illinois. Segregation may have forced African-Americans to build their own city within a city here in Bronzeville, but that didn't stop many of them from eagerly signing up to serve their country. This was the first armory in the nation built to serve an African-American military regiment. 
The 8th Regiment was unique in that African Americans served as the officers as well as the rank and file, going all the way back to the Spanish-American War. In World War I, the Fighting 8th sent more than 2,000 men to France. This monument was erected near the armory in 1927 to honor their achievements. The armory is now the home of the Chicago Military Academy at Bronzeville, a Chicago public high school. And this neighborhood's role in American military history goes back even further. Here in this park at 32nd Street is an area where the ground is elevated slightly above street level. An archaeologist has discovered that these are the buried foundations of a Civil War POW camp. 26,000 Confederate soldiers were imprisoned here at Camp Douglas starting in 1862. The living conditions were terrible, claiming the lives of one in seven prisoners. The land had been donated to the Union Army by Senator Stephen A. Douglas. Douglas is best remembered as Abraham Lincoln's opponent in the Great Debates. He bought 70 acres here in 1852 to build his estate. It was a shrewd gamble on Chicago's future. To boost the value of his investment, Douglas helped establish an early University of Chicago on this property. The school operated here through the Civil War, though it suffered declining enrollment when that POW camp opened across the street. Douglas's final resting place is here at 35th Street. But so many other traces of this neighborhood's past have been wiped away. During World War II, Bronzeville was increasingly plagued by overcrowding and decay. After the war, a wave of urban renewal leveled large sections of the neighborhood to make way for modernist high-rises, the Illinois Institute of Technology, public housing, and an expansion of Michael Reese Hospital. Now, as many of those grand plans are being laid to waste, yet another wave of redevelopment seeks to capitalize on Bronzeville's African-American heritage. The city designated this the Black Metropolis Bronzeville Historic District in 1998 and installed works of public art along King Drive that celebrate its past, including this Monument to the Great Northern Migration. It commemorates the more than half million Southern African Americans who traveled to Chicago in the 20th century. The bronze figure is wearing a suit made from worn shoe soles symbolizing the long, difficult journey. From Bronzeville to Beverly, Lakeview to The Loop, getting around Chicago on a bike has never been easier. In the last two decades, the city has completed a 100-mile network of bike lanes with 50 miles of trails, bike-friendly buses and L stations, 12,000 bike racks, and even a bicycle garage at Millennium Park. It's no secret who peddled this transformation. Chicago's longtime cyclist-in-chief said he wanted to make this the most bicycle-friendly city in the United States. So how did Richard M. Daly become a cycling enthusiast? Well, it turns out it runs in the family. His father, Richard J. Daly, created Chicago's first on-street bike routes in 1971. But perhaps the elder Daly's most lasting gift to the city's cyclists is our 18 and a half mile long lakefront trail. During his reign, it was officially designated a bicycle path in 1963. But the Dailies weren't the first cyclists to occupy City Hall. Way back in 1897, Mayor Carter Harrison II launched his campaign with a 100-mile round-trip bike ride between Chicago and Waukegan, a stunt he hoped would win favor with his fellow cyclists. He finished the trek in nine and a half hours, an impressive ride. 
but Harrison's modestly formulated campaign slogan was, not the champion cyclist, but the cyclist's champion. Either way, he won the race to City Hall. Harrison attributed his victory to strong support among cyclists, whom he rewarded by building a bike path from Edgewater to Evanston. The bicyclist voting bloc wielded considerable clout in Chicago politics. Years before the popularization of the automobile, they lobbied successfully to build bike-friendly paved roads and to turn Jackson Street into a streetcar-free Jackson Boulevard. The city's cyclists continue to flex their political muscle today. At a monthly event called Critical Mass, they'll even block car traffic to assert their place on our city's streets. Continuing south on King Drive, we reach one of Chicago's most storied intersections at 47th Street. This was the site of the Regal Theater, where music legends like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, and Lena Horne performed. Built as a movie palace in 1928, the 3,000-seat theater gave African Americans all the glitz and glamour previously reserved for white audiences. Next door was the Savoy Ballroom, another destination for big-name entertainment. With a half-acre dance floor, the Savoy was big enough to host 6,000 dancers, or even a basketball game. The home team Savoy Big Five became world famous when sports promoter Abe Saperstein took them on the road in 1929. He decided the Chicago team might sell more tickets with a name that reminded fans of New York's famous black enclave. And they became the Harlem Globetrotters. Many 47th Street landmarks have been demolished, including the Savoy Ballroom and the Regal Theater. They stood here at the site of the $20 million Harold Washington Cultural Center. Built in 2004, its mission is to preserve African American arts and culture. In addition to a thousand seat theater, the facility boasts state of the art audio and video production facilities. The Cultural Center is named, of course, for Chicago's first black mayor. Further west on 47th Street is one of the nation's earliest experiments in subsidized housing the Michigan Boulevard Garden Apartments. The Rosenwald, as it was known, was built by Sears Roebuck Chairman Julius Rosenwald in 1929 to provide quality, affordable housing to African Americans. The complex was designed by Rosenwald's nephew, architect Ernest Grunsfeld, whose best known work is the Adler Planetarium. Unlike many of the public housing developments that followed, the Rosenwald was known as a safe, attractive, and even desirable place to raise a family. Its residents included future Pulitzer Prize-winning poet Gwendolyn Brooks, singer Nat King Cole, boxing great Joe Lewis, and music legend Quincy Jones. The Rosenwald has been vacant since 2000. Its future is uncertain. Many of Bronzeville's movers and shakers lived in the magnificent mansions that lined what was then Grand Boulevard. Like Oscar de Priest, he served as Chicago's first black alderman before being elected to the U.S. House of Representatives back in 1928. This was the home of civil rights advocate Ida B. Wells. Singer and actress Etta Moten Barnett lived down the street as did Bessie Coleman, a pioneering African-American aviator. Other Bronzeville homes belonged to Louis Armstrong, author Richard Wright, Olympic sprinter turned Congressman Ralph Metcalf, boxer Jack Johnson, and singers Sam Cooke, Lou Rawls, and Dinah Washington. And this was the home of Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, an African-American surgeon who performed the world's first open heart surgery. Maybe the most prized addresses on the south side 
We're a few blocks east of King Drive, here on another boulevard, Drexel Boulevard. This boulevard is named for a Philadelphia banker who likely never set foot in Chicago. Francis Drexel acquired 80 acres of real estate here through a foreclosure in the 1840s. At the time, this was wide open prairie at the outskirts of the city. But when it was announced that a network of scenic boulevards and parks was coming through, it attracted some of Chicago's wealthiest citizens. Drexel's sons erected this fountain in his memory at the south end of the boulevard. It's the city's oldest public fountain. It now sits in one of the south side's most fashionable neighborhoods. Kenwood has been called the Lake Forest of the south side. Its homes were built by captains of industry like meatpacker Gustavus Swift and lumber baron Martin Ryerson. This is the longtime home of Nation of Islam minister Louis Farrakhan. It's part of a larger compound built by his predecessor, Elijah Muhammad. Boxer Muhammad Ali moved into this home nearby in order to be close to the Nation of Islam leaders. And then there's Kenwood's most famous current resident, whose home is hidden behind a series of barricades. He's been living in a slightly larger house in Washington, D.C. One of Drexel Boulevard's most recognizable landmarks is the longtime headquarters of Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition. Now, if you look closely at the stained glass windows, you'll see stars of David and images of the Ten Commandments. That's because this building was originally a synagogue. Many African-American institutions in this area are housed in former synagogues. This was once the heart of Chicago's German Jewish community, which preceded African Americans in settling the South Side Boulevards. This was the home of Jewish brothers Groucho, Harpo, and Chico. The Marx Brothers moved to Chicago in 1910 because it was a hub for the nation's vaudeville circuit. They later took their act to Broadway before launching their legendary movie career. Pedaling south on Drexel Boulevard, we come to Washington Park, the first of several parks we'll visit in this show. Both Washington Park and Jackson Park to the east were laid out by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Box, best known as the designers of New York's Central Park. But when Olmsted first visited the site for these parks, he was not impressed. He described it as extremely bleak and decried the absence of sublime or picturesque elevations of land. Though one feature did grab Olmsted's eye. Olmsted took full advantage of Lake Michigan in his design for these parks. He created a lakefront promenade and he connected the lake to a series of striking lagoons. Jackson and Washington Parks were to be linked by a boulevard with a canal running down the center, making it possible to travel by boat from Lake Michigan to Washington Park a mile and a half inland. The canal was never built, but Olmsted's Boulevard, known as the Midway Plaisance, runs through the University of Chicago campus today. Here at the western end of the Midway is an astonishing sculpture that consumed 14 years of its artist's life. It's Laredo Taft's Fountain of Time from 1922. On one side of a reflecting pool, Taft depicts Father Time, a haunting 26-foot-tall form. He watches over a procession of a hundred human figures representing every phase of human life. Immortalized among the faces is Laredo Taft himself. The sculptor drew his inspiration from the poem Paradox of Time by Henry Austin Dobson, which reads, 
time goes, you say? Ah, no. Alas, time stays. We go. Not even the fountain itself escaped the ravages of time. Taft originally wanted it to be made from marble or bronze, but both were too expensive, so he settled on concrete, which cracked and deteriorated over the years. But in 2007, after a $2 million restoration, the basin was filled with water for the first time in more than 50 years. On one end of Washington Park is a vast lawn that Frederick Law Olmsted dubbed the South Open Green. It was once groomed by a flock of 30 grazing sheep, which were cared for by a full-time shepherd. More recently, this was the proposed site of a 95,000-seat Olympic Stadium in Chicago's bid to host the 2016 Summer Games. Of course, we all know how that turned out. But once upon a time, this neighborhood did boast a big-name sporting venue. The Washington Park Racetrack drew crowds of nearly 50,000 in the 19th century to watch and gamble on the ponies. Its clubhouse was a playground for Chicago socialites, with a membership that was said to include three-quarters of the city's millionaires. The track also hosted major bike races, featuring some of the sport's early superstars, like Arthur Zimmerman. He later became cycling's first international champion at another Chicago venue. The city shut down Washington Park Racetrack in 1905 as part of a crackdown on gambling. But by that time, there were plenty of other entertainment options south of Washington Park here in the Woodlawn neighborhood. When Jackson Park was chosen as the site of the 1893 World's Fair, it set off a mad land rush in Woodlawn. Twelve years after the fair, the White City Amusement Park opened in Woodlawn. It took its name from the fair's whitewashed architecture. Its most famous attraction was a 300-foot-tall electric tower illuminated by 20,000 light bulbs. White City also had an aviation hangar where Goodyear's first commercial blimp began its maiden voyage on July 21, 1919. But the day ended in tragedy when the blimp burst into flames and crashed into a LaSalle Street bank. Woodlawn also had a Frank Lloyd Wright designed beer garden. At Midway Gardens, Wright took this traditionally lowbrow institution and filled it with high art and culture. Working with sculptor Alfonso Ianelli, Wright designed nearly everything in the entertainment complex, from the furniture and fine china to the murals and sculptures, including the now famous sprites. The complex was converted into a car wash before being demolished in 1929. 63rd Street and Cottage Grove Avenue became the hub of neighborhood nightlife in the Roaring Twenties. With nearly 4,000 seats, the Tivoli Theater was the largest movie palace in the city when it opened in 1921. Nearby, the famous dance floor at the Trianon Ballroom held 3,000. They came out to hear big-name bands like Lawrence Welk and his Champagne Music Makers. But at the Trianon Ballroom, White City, and nearly every other Woodlawn establishment, African Americans weren't welcome. What's more, white property owners here agreed not to sell or rent their homes to African Americans by signing so-called restrictive covenants. It was an ugly chapter in Chicago history but it did inspire two of the city's most important literary figures. The first was James T. Farrell, who grew up just west of Washington Park in this building. Drawing from his childhood experiences, Farrell wrote a series of novels about Studs Lonigan, a fictional character confronting the very real racial tension in Washington Park. Yeah, come on, Paul. It was later made into a movie featuring a young Jack Nicholson. You're in the pain business, ain't you? The pain business uses alcohol, don't it? Just south of Farrell's stomping grounds, a future black playwright lived in this home in an otherwise all-white subdivision. 
Lorraine Hansberry was just seven years old when her father bought the house to challenge the subdivision's restrictive covenant. A judge ordered the Hansberries to vacate their home, but the family fought the restrictive covenant all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which finally ruled in their favor. The episode not only forever changed the face of this neighborhood, it inspired Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, the first Broadway play by an African-American woman. It was also made into a film starring Sidney Poitier. Now we don't intend to cause no trouble or fight no causes, and we're gonna try to be good neighbors. Today, Washington Park is a thriving center for African-American culture. It's the end of the route for the annual Bud Billiken Day Parade and Picnic. It's been called the largest parade in the United States, drawing more than 75,000 participants and one and a half million spectators. The first Bud Billiken Day Parade was organized in 1929 by the Chicago Defender as a salute to the kids who sold the newspaper. Bud Billiken is not a real person. He's a fictional character created by the Defender, inspired by a Buddha-like figurine called a Billiken. The Bud Billiken Day Parade may be only one day out of the year, but all year round, African-American history and culture are on display here in Washington Park at the DuSable Museum of African-American History. The museum traces the African-American experience from Africa, through slavery, to the civil rights movement and beyond. And it houses a significant collection of African-American art. This exhibit brings to life the City Hall office of Mayor Harold Washington and the mayor himself. Hi, welcome back to my office. I am Harold Washington. The DuSable Museum started in the Bronzeville home of artist and educator Dr. Margaret Burroughs in 1961. It was originally called the Ebony Museum, but was renamed for Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, Chicago's first permanent non-native settler. The museum moved into this Daniel Burnham-designed building in 1973. In 2010, it expanded into another Burnham-designed building next door. This former horse stable from 1880 is actually Daniel Burnham's oldest remaining building. The large circular room known as the Roundhouse once had space for 60 horses. Now it'll provide 61,000 square feet of gallery and educational space for the DuSable Museum. Now let's head west from Washington Park on Garfield Boulevard. It's easy to pass right on by this old unused L station without stopping to take notice. But this little bungalow-like gem is Chicago's oldest L station. It was built in 1892 along the city's first L line, which was being expanded to carry visitors to the World's Fair. What's now the Green Line was then called the Alley L. It was built above the alley so its developer wouldn't need permission from private property holders along the route. You'll notice that the steel overpass here was designed to be more decorative than most because it crosses one of Chicago's scenic boulevards. Moving west on Garfield and crossing the Dan Ryan Expressway, the boulevard gradually loses its luster. This is the northern edge of the Englewood neighborhood. For most Chicagoans, their only exposure to Englewood is on the evening news. The often publicized poverty and violence here resulted in an exodus of half of its population in the span of just 30 years. Looking around today, 
you see the scars of that population loss everywhere. But amidst the vacant lots here on Lafayette Avenue is a reminder of this neighborhood's more prosperous past. The Raber House is one of only a handful of buildings in the city that predate the Chicago fire. Businessman and politician John Raber built the home here in 1870 on a six-acre country estate in an area originally known as Junction Grove. It was named for a nearby rail junction, which attracted German and Irish railroad workers to what eventually became the town of Englewood. Some of the more successful settlers built large homes along Garfield Boulevard. This mansion belonged to gambling king Big Jim O'Leary, whose mom owned the infamous cow blamed for starting the Chicago fire. The home was designed by architect Zachary Taylor Davis, who later built both Wrigley Field and the old Comiskey Park. Englewood's most notorious resident lived here on 63rd Street more than 100 years ago. This post office stands on the site of a so-called house of horrors built by one of America's first serial killers. Dr. H. H. Holmes preyed on young women who visited Chicago for the World's Fair of 1893, and he custom built his Englewood Hotel for that purpose. It hid a maze of secret rooms, airtight vaults, and crematoriums. When Holmes was finally apprehended, he confessed to killing 27. The story was recounted in Eric Larson's 2003 novel, Devil in the White City. Just down 63rd Street from Holmes' castle was the historic commercial hub of Englewood. In the 1920s, 63rd and Halstead was the second busiest shopping district in Chicago after the Loop. For 40 years now, the city has tried desperately to return this intersection to its former glory, turning it into a suburban-style mall, then removing the mall, and more recently, demolishing much of the shopping district altogether to make room for a new 40-acre community college campus. Kennedy King College brings as many as 4,000 students a day to this neighborhood. That's inspired a whole new wave of residential and commercial development around here and that, in turn, has raised hopes for Englewood's future. As Garfield Boulevard carries us farther away from Lake Michigan, the last thing you'd expect to find is an island. But that's just one of many surprises here in Sherman Park. The park's designers tucked the ball fields away on a secluded island isolated from the noise and traffic of the city. Sherman Park was built in this hard scrabble immigrant enclave in 1905 as part of a revolutionary experiment in park design. At the time, most of Chicago's parks were in wealthier neighborhoods at the edges of the city where the immigrant poor couldn't access them. This park not only offered these laborers a much needed dose of breathing space, it also gave them a place to study English, get a hot meal, and even medical treatment in a new type of building called a field house. This Daniel Burnham designed field house was one of the first in the world. Inside, a series of murals from 1912 depict the history of North America. Yet another park sits at the west end of Garfield Boulevard. Gage Park was created in the 1870s at a turning point in the boulevard circuit. From here, we start our journey north along Western Boulevard. Here, the boulevard runs alongside its traffic-choked cousin, Western Avenue. Western is Chicago's longest street, running 23 and a half miles, the entire length of the city. This old firehouse on Western is the new home of one of the city's most overlooked museums, the Fire Museum of Greater Chicago. Chicago's been cursed by its share of terrible fires. This museum not only commemorates these disasters, but it celebrates the many innovations in firefighting that have been pioneered by the Chicago Fire Department, like the fire pole, 
invented in Chicago in 1878, and the world's first firefighting snorkel. The museum also showcases some of the more archaic technologies from the past, like a hand-drawn fire engine, wooden water mains, and leather buckets for bucket brigades. Moving north, this stretch of Western Boulevard starts to take on a very industrial flavor. That's because it's part of the gritty neighborhood that emerged behind Chicago's stockyards in the 19th century, a neighborhood called Back of the Yards. The stockyards may be gone, but the laborers who butchered its beef and packed its pork left behind plenty to remember them by. You can still see the old wooden two flats where they lived and the churches where they worshiped, built by Germans, Irish, Poles, Bohemians, Lithuanians, Slovaks, and Mexicans. They came from all over the world to do the dirtiest of dirty work, slaughtering, butchering, and packing as many as 18 million animals a year for as little as 16 cents an hour. The working conditions were deplorable, and the living conditions weren't much better. Most laborers lived along mud streets in ramshackle tenements with no access to sewers, their drain water and garbage pooling in roadside ditches. The entire neighborhood was blanketed by a cloud of smoke and an oppressive stench coming from the stockyards to the east and the largest city garbage dump to the west. And to the north was Budley Creek, a fork of the Chicago River that served as an open sewer for the packing houses. To this day, it still occasionally bubbles from the decomposing debris dumped here decades ago. At the dawn of the 20th century, social reformers fought to create some desperately needed green space in this neighborhood, like McKinley Park, it opened in 1902 here on the site of an old horse racing track, which had been built by Chicago Mayor Long John Wentworth. The new park was named for President William McKinley, who was assassinated just months before it opened. McKinley Park almost didn't have a sculpture of President McKinley. That's because the nation was in the midst of an economic recession, so there was very little money for materials. So, sculptor Charles Mulligan recycled a much ridiculed statue of Christopher Columbus that once stood on the lakefront at Congress. The Tribune called that old sculpture a nightmare of art that wore a look of discomfort on its face. So, Christopher Columbus was melted down and resurrected as William McKinley. This set of extraordinary buildings behind McKinley Park proves once again that they just don't build them like they used to. This is America's first industrial park, the Central Manufacturing District. Its striking architecture is a far cry from the roadside industrial parks we know today. It was created in 1905 under a revolutionary premise that companies could lower their overhead costs by sharing a single complex with a shared power plant, freight station, and even a bank. The old terracotta logos identify the district's original tenants. A century later, some of these buildings are still being used by mid-sized manufacturers. A newer industrial park on the site of the stockyards provides space for about 70 companies employing thousands of local residents, many of them Mexican immigrants. <laughs> Today, the population around McKinley Park and back of the yards is majority Mexican-American. While many are recent immigrants, there has been a sizable Mexican community here for nearly a century. After World War I, the stockyards attracted thousands of laborers from south of the border, many of whom had fled the Mexican Revolution of 1910. Just west of Western Boulevard is a relic from the days when this area was the center of Chicago's explosives industry. The DuPont Company built this Italianate-style mansion in 1876 for an executive of its nearby gunpowder plant. 
gunpowder manufacturing was a risky business, so DuPont and others built their plants far from the population center, out here in what was then the tiny village of Brighton Park. But then, on August 29, 1886, lightning struck a local gunpowder warehouse. The resulting blast leveled much of the area, killing at least three. It even blew out windows at the Board of Trade nearly five miles away. The citizens of Brighton Park promptly exiled the powder mills even farther beyond the city limits. Looking around Chicago, it seems everyone is getting in on a bicycling craze. And yet, when cycling was introduced to this city, it was anything but a populist pastime. The high-wheel bicycle of the 1870s cost as much as $300, nearly a year's wages for your average Chicagoan. Cycling wasn't so much an everyday mode of transportation as it was a high-class form of leisure. Most wheelmen, as bicyclists were known, belonged to one of Chicago's fashionable cycle clubs. Its wealthy members gathered at well-appointed clubhouses to dine and play billiards at the end of a long day of riding. Today, a handful of nostalgia-seeking clubs are keeping up the traditions of Chicago's early cyclists including the Shriners. Chicago's early cyclists tended to be not only rich, but athletic. The big front wheel is a chore to climb. And once you're up here, it's not much easier to pedal. The slightest rut can send a rider tumbling. But all that changed with the popularization of the so-called safety bicycle in the 1890s. It was not only easier to ride, it was cheaper than a horse, and you didn't have to feed it. Middle-class Chicagoans used these machines to get around town and to get out of town. On Sundays, they escaped their overcrowded neighborhoods by following the city's well-paved boulevards to the outlying parks and beyond. For many women, the bicycle offered their first opportunity to explore the city on their own and get some exercise. What's more, it liberated them from restrictive Victorian clothing. Women traded in their dresses for more practical riding attire, like bloomers and divided skirts. These shocking new fashions did raise more than a few eyebrows. Many worried that biking would overdevelop a woman's leg muscles and afflict her with a skin condition known as scorcher's flush. Though one prominent conservative was decidedly pro-bicycle. The Evanston-based temperance crusader Frances Willard took up cycling at the age of 53. She wrote a best-selling book which championed bicycling as an emancipating force for women. But the 19th century's biggest female cycling sensation was a Jewish mother of three named Annie Kopchowski. She biked around the world in 11 months, starting and ending her journey in Chicago. She financed the trip in part through product endorsements and by placing ads on her Chicago-made Sterling brand bicycle. But Sterling wasn't the only local bike brand. In the 1890s, Chicago became the bicycle building capital of America. It was said that two-thirds of the nation's bikes were produced in Chicago by 88 local companies. You can still see their former factories scattered across the city. The most famous was founded by German immigrant Ignaz Schwinn and meatpacker Adolf Arnold. Schwinn got its start making high-quality racing bikes in 1895 but really hit it big, designing bikes that were stylish and fun. The company struck gold in the 1950s and 60s when it made millions of Phantom, Stingray, and Varsity models for suburban baby boomers. Schwinn was based on Chicago's west side until 1993 when it skipped town to Boulder, Colorado. 
Now, let's continue riding north along the boulevards through Chicago's historic west side. A series of striking Art Deco style viaducts and bridges carry us under railroad tracks and then over the Sanitary and Ship Canal. This man-made channel permanently reversed the flow of the Chicago River in 1900, diverting its waters away from Lake Michigan and towards the Des Plaines River. It was designed to improve the city's drinking water by sending our sewage down the Mississippi. We've seen how many of the boulevards became choice destinations for wealthy Chicagoans, but there's one boulevard address that's definitely not fashionable. 26th in California, Cook County Jail. It's one of the nation's largest county jails. On any given day, about 9,000 men and women are detained here in a vast maze of dormitories that covers more than 10 city blocks. But when the jail opened here in 1929, it consisted of just one building. At the time, this was a deserted section of the southwest side, occupied only by the Bridewell, an old jail where the city housed its petty offenders. The county chose to move its jailhouse far from the loop so it wouldn't spoil downtown property values. But on the day it opened, April Fool's Day, 1929, the 1,300-bed facility was already overcrowded. Later came an epidemic of persistent poverty, guns, drugs, and tough-on-crime policies. The number of detainees continued to grow, and so did the jail. From that single building to 11 jail divisions on a sprawling 96-acre campus. But in a reversal of the decades-long trend, the county was able to close dozens of cell blocks in 2010 thanks to a declining inmate population. Some experts attribute the change to a drop in crime, but others say the police have simply made fewer arrests. These cells have been occupied by plenty of infamous criminals over the years, like Al Capone and Frank Nitti, Jeff Fort, Richard Speck, and John Wayne Gacy. The jail also served as an unlikely setting for a Broadway musical and hit movie. Take her down to the Cook County Jail. Chicago is the story of women on Cook County Jail's murderer's row, fighting for stardom and their lives. Murderous row, we call it. Oh. Is that nicer? Next door to the jail is the neoclassically designed criminal courthouse building. It looks like it might belong more in ancient Rome than on Chicago's southwest side. Right down to the Latin inscription, SPQC. That stands for Senatus Populus Quae Chicago, or the Senate and People of Chicago. As we ride north, the west side's urban jungle recedes and we're transported to a tranquil lily pool near the shores of a large lake. This is Douglas Park. It's one of three spectacular West Side parks laid out in the 1870s by architect William LeBaron Jenny. Jenny is best known as the father of the skyscraper for his pioneering use of steel skeleton construction, which made tall buildings possible. His now demolished home insurance building downtown is often considered the world's first skyscraper. But these parks presented a different kind of engineering challenge for William LeBaron and Jenny. The landscape here was swampy and uneven. Rather than drain the swamps completely, Jenny channeled the water into these lagoons, and then he leveled out Douglas Park with 40,000 yards of manure that he had trucked in from the stockyards. These west side parks are linked by a chain of formal boulevards, punctuated by a series of historic park-like squares, including Independence Square. The fountain here is probably the only one in the world to depict kids playing with fireworks. The Independence Day themed work by Charles Mulligan was dedicated on July 4th, 1902. 
Water originally flowed from the Roman candles, which were electrically lighted in red, white, and blue. The construction of these west side boulevards and parks dragged on for decades. It was plagued by Chicago-style political corruption and graft. And yet, despite the unfinished green spaces here, this neighborhood became a magnet for industrial workers in the late 19th century, thanks to a wealth of manufacturing jobs. Real estate developers named the neighborhood Lawndale. It was surrounded by some of Chicago's largest employers, like Ryerson Steel, International Harvester, Western Electric, and Sears Roebuck and Company. It occupied this 14-story structure known today as the original Sears Tower. Nearly 70 years before the mail order giant built that other tower downtown, this was a popular tourist attraction and a famous symbol of the company. Its image appeared in millions of Sears catalogs, which were distributed across the country. When the tower was completed in 1906, it was part of a 40-acre complex, which the company called the largest mercantile plant in the world. Sears needed the space. An army of 9,000 employees processed and shipped 35,000 orders a day to its mail order customers. Sears named its popular Hallmark brand for its address here at Holman and Arthington. This is also where the company launched its own line of insurance, Allstate. And on the tower's 11th floor, Sears started a radio station in 1924. WLS stood for World's Largest Store. By 1930, Lawndale was the center of what Yiddish speakers called the Great West Side. Chicago had the third largest Jewish population in the world after Warsaw and New York, and 110,000 of them lived in and around Lawndale. While the neighborhood is mostly African American today, remnants of Lawndale's Jewish past are everywhere. There were synagogues, more than 60 of them. The largest was Anshe Knesseth Israel. It seated 3,500 and attracted renowned religious scholars from Eastern Europe. Another, Kehilath Yaakob, had a band featuring a budding clarinetist named Benny Goodman. The Douglas Park Auditorium housed Jewish labor organizations and a popular Yiddish language theater. Among the performers here was Bernie Schwartz, who later changed his name to Tony Curtis. The local library branch boasted a significant collection of Yiddish and Hebrew books managed by a young librarian named Golda Meir. The future Prime Minister of Israel lived in this building on South Lawndale Avenue. Roosevelt Road was the commercial core of Jewish Lawndale. Neighborhood kids could grab a bite at Salmon High's or Fluky's Hot Dogs and then catch a movie at Balaban and Katz's Central Park Theater, one of the world's first movie palaces. It's now an African-American church. After World War II, most Jews moved out of Lawndale to outlying neighborhoods and suburbs where they could find single-family homes. In just a few short years, this neighborhood, which had been majority Jewish, became 91% African-American. They found a neighborhood in decline. Through the Great Depression and World War II, most homeowners hadn't been able to maintain their aging two flats and apartments. And most of the jobs that had once made Lawndale so attractive were not available to the neighborhood's new residents. By the mid-1960s, much of the neighborhood's black middle class was gone, and the neighborhood was plagued by unemployment, poverty, and crime. And that caught the attention of Martin Luther King Jr. In January of 1966, he moved his family from Atlanta, Georgia, to Lawndale, where they took up residence in a dingy apartment. 
King's plan was to highlight living conditions in urban slums as part of a campaign called the Chicago Freedom Movement. The movement sought to pressure the city to clean up neighborhoods like Lawndale and crack down on absentee landlords. There is no doubt about the despair in the Negro community, and I don't think we deal with that despair by doing nothing. King took over management of this six flat on Holman Avenue to show that slum housing could be rehabilitated if only landlords would reinvest tenants' rent money. King also fought to open Chicago's segregated housing markets. He led marches to all white areas like Gage Park and Marquette Park, where marchers encountered angry mobs. And King himself was hit with a brick. I have never seen, even in Mississippi and Alabama, mobs as hostile and as hate-filled as I've seen in Chicago. In the end, Martin Luther King won an agreement from Mayor Richard J. Daley that the city should promote fair housing, and the civil rights leader returned to the South. But Daley's promises were not fulfilled. When King was killed two years later, the neighborhood that had been his temporary home erupted in violence. Shoot to kill any arsonist or anyone with a Molotov cocktail in their hand in Chicago. By the time the rioting was over, seven were dead, 500 injured, and 175 buildings had been destroyed. 40 years later, you can still see evidence of those riots. Yet, after decades of disinvestment and decline in Lawndale, there have been some positive developments here lately. For the first time in decades, new shopping and market rate housing have sprouted up here, most notably on the site of the old Sears Roebuck plant. Holman Square is a mixed income development that includes housing, schools, and a $28 million community center. The old powerhouse, which once generated electricity for the Sears complex, has been converted into Powerhouse High, a new charter school. The architect's environmentally friendly renovation preserved much of the original machinery, which serves as a learning tool for the students. And Lawndale has also become something of a hub for community gardening. These urban farmers aren't just beautifying the neighborhood, they're cultivating all kinds of food, including garlic, lettuce, and even honey, which is then sold online and at local farmer's markets. The centerpiece of Chicago's West Side Park System is Garfield Park. Here, you continue to see remnants of William LeBaire and Jenny's lagoons. But in other places, this park's design is inspired by the native Midwestern landscape. This is the legacy of Jens Jensen, known as the dean of the prairie style of landscape architecture. Jensen became the chief landscape architect for the West Side Parks in 1905. A Danish immigrant, he got his start in Chicago as a day laborer. He spent many hours tending to fragile foreign plants in the formal gardens that were so fashionable at the time. But Jensen quickly realized that this non-native flora just didn't take well to Chicago's soil and climate. So he started experimenting. Jensen gathered wildflowers from nearby woods and transplanted them to a Chicago park. To Jensen's predecessors, this indigenous Midwestern landscape appeared desolate and littered with weeds. But Jens Jensen found that these native plants not only thrived, they were also beautiful. These West Side parks gave Jensen his first chance to try out his ideas on a large scale. He created meadows edged with native trees and commissioned buildings in the naturalistic prairie style. Though Jensen did allow for a few formal gardens, which he apologetically referred to as the folly of my youth. 
Jensen's most well-known contribution to these parks is Garfield Park Conservatory, and it too is built to resemble the local landscape. Jensen wanted it to look like a huge Midwestern haystack, but inside you're transported to a whole different world. When it opened in 1908, this conservatory was considered nothing short of revolutionary. At the time, most greenhouses displayed a bunch of potted plants clumped together in a museum-like setting. But here, Jensen composed elaborate naturalistic scenes that looked like real outdoor landscapes. The conservatory's centerpiece is the Fern Room. Its lagoon appears to be fed by a prairie waterfall. It's so realistic, early visitors were often convinced the conservatory was built around a natural spring. From the beginning, this conservatory housed an important collection of rare and valuable plants. This double coconut palm is believed to be the largest growing in captivity in the world. Of course, the seasonal flower shows here are a perennial favorite. And over the years, the staff horticulturalists have created hundreds of new flower varieties with names like the Jane Addams Water Lily and the Eleanor Daly Chrysanthemum. After many years of lagging attendance, the conservatory has seen a renaissance since 2001. That year, it hosted a popular art glass installation by artist Dale Chihuly, which brought more than half a million people through its doors. A deluge of large donations has allowed the conservatory to restore old spaces and add new ones, like the interactive children's garden. Behind the conservatory, the park district added this city garden, which features hardy plants that are well suited to city living. Believe it or not, there was a plan in the 1950s to destroy most of Garfield Park. Administrators at the University of Illinois were looking for a location for a new Chicago campus, and Garfield Park was their top choice. But Mayor Richard J. Daly preferred a site at the Circle Expressway Interchange west of the Loop. And in 1965, the so-called Circle Campus opened. Garfield Park sports what is undoubtedly Chicago's flashiest field house, the Gold Dome Building from 1928. It once housed the West Park Police Force, which patrolled the parks in search of everything from runaway horses to lilac thieves. Scoff laws could be detained right here in the building, which once had holding cells. For the rotunda walls, architects Michelson and Rogenstadt included a series of bas-relief panels that celebrate great achievements of the 20th century. In one, representing advances in art and architecture, the sculptor rather immodestly depicted this building. Michelson and Rogenstadt also designed the Midwest Athletic Club building across the street. The elegant club catered to West Side businessmen in the 1920s with an Olympic-sized pool, two ballrooms, and a running track. At the time, this neighborhood was flush with private clubs, high-class hotels, and first-rate theaters, thanks in part to a French-Canadian real estate mogul named Louis Guyon. He got his start in Chicago as a dance instructor and an extremely conservative one at that. At a time when the Foxtrot and Charleston were catching on, Guyon taught waltzes and his patented military two-step. He preached that hot jazz and modern dance were indecent and allegedly went so far as to forge an edict from the Chicago Archdiocese denouncing the tango. Guyon started his real estate empire on Crawford Avenue with the Paradise Ballroom where fast tempo music and close dancing were banned and people of color were not welcome. The Paradise Ballroom and nearby Paradise Theater are gone. And next door, what was once the Guyon Hotel is vacant. When it opened as a residential hotel in 1928, its amenities included a private motor coach and maid service. 
Its second floor ballroom housed the original studios of classical music station WFMT. As I mentioned earlier, Chicago's parks were a popular destination for turn-of-the-century cyclists. But to local officials, bicyclists were more of a nuisance than anything else. Fast riders, known as scorchers, were known to scare horses and spoil the peace and quiet of Chicago's green spaces. The authorities at first banned cyclists from the parks altogether before allowing them back under strict speed limits of six to eight miles an hour. In Garfield Park, they tried another tactic. Park commissioners sought to get scorchers off the roads by building them a designated cycling track. The half mile loop was scientifically designed for speed with banked concrete surfaces which circled the infield of a horse racing track. The famously fast cycling course attracted record seekers from around the country, including an African-American sensation named Major Taylor. He was among the first black athletes in any sport to become a world champion, taking titles across Europe, Canada, and Australia. But here in America, racism often prevented Taylor from competing. In an attempt to join the all-white field at Chicago's prestigious Pullman race, he went so far as to bleach his skin. But at Garfield Park, it was just Major Taylor against the clock, and he set a series of stunning world records here, including one mile in a minute and 19 seconds. The Garfield Park track is gone, but on Chicago's southwest side, the seven-mile-long Major Taylor bike trail was built in his honor. He's buried near the trail at Mount Glenwood Cemetery. If you've ever had the misfortune of having your car towed by the city, you might be familiar with this industrial area northeast of Garfield Park. But right next door to the municipal auto pound is an unlikely hub of environmentalism. The Chicago Center for Green Technology is located in an old building on a former dumping site for construction debris. The building underwent a dramatic green facelift in 2002 that added a rainwater collection system, solar panels on the green roof, and an elevator that runs on canola oil. But just as important as the building's bells and whistles is its purpose. It's a resource center where the public can learn about green technology and design. And it's a home for green businesses. Behind the center, an entire eco-industrial park is emerging that's anchored by the headquarters of a large landscaping firm. Many advocates envision Chicago's boulevards as a key to the city's environmental future. The architecture firm Urban Lab would like to transform these streets into eco-boulevards that could treat the city's wastewater and stormwater naturally. Another, TGDA, imagines the boulevards as a public transportation spine that connects existing transit lines and enhances green spaces to stimulate economic development in underserved neighborhoods. And bicycling advocates want to create bike boulevards like this one in Portland, Oregon which would ease auto congestion and serve as major thoroughfares for two-wheeled traffic. The third and final West Side Park is Humboldt Park. It's a showcase for some of Jens Jensen's finest work. He transformed a lagoon into this meandering prairie river fed by two rocky brooks. Jensen's office, while he worked on the park, was in this former horse stable. Architects Froman and Jebsen designed the stable to look like a German country house, in a nod to the Germans who settled around Humboldt Park. One of the best ways to discover the ethnic history of this neighborhood is to look at the statues here. The Germans erected this statue in 1892 to Alexander von Humboldt. He was the German scientist and explorer for whom the park is named. They also raised this monument to German author Fritz Reuter. Later came the Poles. They added a statue of Thaddeus Kosciuszko, a Polish hero of the American Revolution. It's since been moved to Solidarity Drive near the aquarium. 
And then there were the Scandinavians. 50,000 of them came to dedicate this Leif Erikson monument in 1901. This area was known as Little Norway. It was said to have the third largest Norwegian population in the world after Oslo and Bergen. One local Norwegian was Knut Rockne, the Notre Dame football coach who was immortalized in the film Knut Rockne, All-American, starring Ronald Reagan. Win just one for the Kipper. Winter sports were especially popular among Scandinavians in Humboldt Park. The lagoons hosted speed skating competitions that drew tens of thousands to the park, including the Silver Skates Derby, the nation's preeminent speed skating tournament. It was a breeding ground for Olympic medalists. Chicago speed skaters have competed in every Olympic Games but one since 1924. Humboldt Park was also a well-known venue for bicycle racing. The wooden track here hosted six-day bicycle races, grueling competitions in which two-man tag teams raced for six days straight. It was one of America's most popular spectator sports in the 1930s, as depicted in the film Six Day Bike Rider, starring comedian Joe E. Brown. It's possible that a more leisurely ride through Humboldt Park helped to inspire the Wizard of Oz. One block from the park was the home of author L. Frank Baum, where he wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. An avid cyclist, Baum would hop on his bike and follow the winding roads of this emerald green park. But Baum's most important inspiration for his Emerald City was probably his visits to Chicago's 1893 World's Fair, known as the White City. By the way, the 1939 MGM film was not Hollywood's first crack at Baum's book. Oz inspired a number of silent films, including this 1910 version, which was filmed right here in Chicago. Well, there's no mistaking the ethnic identity of Humboldt Park. Approaching the neighborhood from either direction on Division Street, you pass beneath 59-foot-tall Puerto Rican flags. The flags mark a stretch of division known as Paseo Boricua, or Puerto Rican Way. For nearly 50 years now, this has been a hub for restaurants, stores, and organizations serving Chicago's 110,000 plus Puerto Ricans. And while many have since moved to the suburbs, this neighborhood still serves as a port of entry for new migrants from the island. Puerto Ricans started coming to Chicago in large numbers in the late 1940s. Most came on airplanes, a first in the history of migration to the U.S. Many Puerto Ricans found work in Chicago as industrial laborers, and an enclave formed in the Lincoln Park neighborhood along Armitage Avenue. But many were pushed out by urban redevelopment and soaring rents, and soon found a more affordable place to put down roots in Humboldt Park. The biggest event on the community's calendar is the annual Fiestas Puerto Ricanas in Humboldt Park, which coincides with the downtown Puerto Rican parade. This week-long festival attracts more than a million people every June. It features plenty of food, games, and of course, music and dance. Humboldt Park's newest Puerto Rican cultural attraction is in the Old Stables Building. The Institute of Puerto Rican Arts and Culture claims to be America's first freestanding cultural institution devoted to Puerto Rican arts. Earlier I showed you how you can learn the ethnic history of this neighborhood by looking at the statues in Humboldt Park but there are no statues to any Puerto Ricans in the park itself. This statue to nationalist leader Pedro Albizu Campos is tucked away on Division Street. 
The park district refused to put this statue in the park because some viewed Campos as a radical figure in the movement for Puerto Rican independence. Heading north from the park on Humboldt Boulevard, we come to an unused railroad embankment that will soon become a bicyclist's paradise. This is the future site of the Bloomingdale Trail. When completed, it'll be a three mile long elevated park that will serve as a major east-west artery for bike and pedestrian traffic. It's just one small piece of Chicago's grand plan for its cycling future. Also in the works is a fancy new addition to the Lakefront Trail that will eventually allow bicyclists to fly over the congestion at Navy Pier and the Chicago River. And a new bike sharing system is already taking hold. But there's still much work to be done if Chicago wants to claim the title of the most bicycle-friendly city in the United States. Cities like New York, Washington DC, and Indianapolis already offer cyclists important amenities like protected bike lanes that create a barrier between bikes and car traffic. Continuing north, we come to Palmer Square, one of the historic west side squares I told you about earlier. While some of the other squares tend to be somewhat underutilized, this is a popular gathering place for the community. Though some think the new velveteen rabbit themed play area is out of keeping with its historic character. Palmer Square is a gateway to the most spectacular west side square, Logan Square. The European style traffic circle here rounds the neighborhood's major landmark, the Illinois Centennial Monument. The 68-foot-tall marble column was erected in 1918 to mark the 100th birthday of the state of Illinois. It was designed by Henry Bacon, architect of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Some people describe Logan Square as a neighborhood in transition, but in fact, this is a neighborhood that's been constantly remaking itself for decades. And if you look around, you'll see a surprising coexistence of its past, present, and future. There are turn-of-the-century mansions that line the boulevards, many built by upwardly mobile Germans and Scandinavians. Though most of those pioneers have moved on, one church here still holds services in Norwegian. Along Milwaukee Avenue, a string of delis and bakeries reminds us of the later wave of Polish settlers to this area. The Latino presence can be seen nearly everywhere here, Puerto Ricans and Cubans flocked to Logan Square in the second half of the 20th century, followed by Mexicans and immigrants from across Latin America. And then there are the young professionals who've increasingly bought property here in recent years, bringing trendy restaurants and stores. But whatever their background, the people of Logan Square all come together on the boulevards. Perhaps more than any other community we've seen in this show, the residents here have a vision of how these green streets can be used. Traffic taming measures are increasingly making the boulevards here pedestrian friendly. On Albany Avenue, they've created Chicago's first home zone. Based on a European concept, it narrows the street with green spaces and diagonal parking to give pedestrians priority over cars. Alongside a subway entrance, community groups have planted a prairie garden. And on the other side of the square, plans are on the table to plant a rare fruit orchard next to a public plaza. Nearby, the city has created an oasis for skateboarders out of an otherwise unusable expressway underpass. And this community has even been known to completely close off the boulevards to car traffic to hold large performances and events. The Logan Square neighborhood essentially marks the end of the boulevard system. Here at the Chicago River, the boulevard narrows to the width of a city street. Now, Diversity Parkway was originally supposed to be a wide boulevard running through the north side, but the north siders were a day late and many thousands of dollars short. While the wealthier South and West Siders were handing over the tax dollars to complete their boulevards, 
the working class residents of the north side were busy fighting these taxes in court. By the time the legal battles were resolved, Diversi was too built up to consider widening the street. Had the network of boulevards been completed, Diversi would have been a broad pleasure drive stretching east to Lincoln Park, where it would have connected to Chicago's most famous boulevard. Lakeshore Drive is probably the most scenic boulevard of all. Though the experience of driving it isn't always so pleasant. Lakeshore Drive didn't begin as a traffic-choked eight-lane highway. In the 19th century, it was a popular carriage drive, lined with trees and flanked by a broad mall where pedestrians could take a leisurely stroll or sit and watch the world go by. Then came the automobile. Speeding motorists used Lakeshore Drive to cut through Lincoln Park, and the park straddled both sides of the drive, forcing beachgoers, golfers, and bicyclists to dodge traffic. It resulted in eight deaths per year, earning Lincoln Park the nickname Killer Park No. 1. So in 1937, the Park District set out to fix the problem. It turned Lakeshore Drive into Chicago's first freeway, featuring a modern system of bridges and underpasses that let park goers get safely to the lakefront and motorists get quickly around town. The freeway also had clover leaf interchanges, though these proved to be dangerous and were later removed. Today's Lakeshore Drive has little resemblance to the leisurely carriage drive of the 19th century, with one exception because it's designated as a boulevard, most commercial traffic is not allowed. For a few hours every year, bicycle riders get to experience Lakeshore Drive as the peaceful pleasure route it once was. The city blocks off Lakeshore Drive to traffic every Memorial Day weekend for Bike the Drive. When you're used to the rush of speeding cars on Lakeshore Drive, the experience can be almost surreal. For once, you're not using the highway to race across town. You're slowing down to take in the sights or even chat with a neighbor. On this one day out of the year, you get a sense of Chicago's boulevards at their best. In an age of ever-growing commutes on superhighways, these green streets force us to slow down and enjoy the ride. And perhaps that's what the visionaries who dreamed up Chicago's boulevards had in mind when they created this system a century and a half ago. It's a system that connects us to our green spaces and to a more leisurely pace, that connects the south side, the west side, and the north side together. While highways all too often divide neighborhoods, Chicago's boulevards not only unite us with our neighbors, but they unite us as a city.
Biking the boulevards is made possible in part by Harris Bank. That's why saving automatically is a great first step, Tom. Yeah, I'll be saving money without even thinking about it. And you'll be surprised at how fast those automatic transfers will add up. Oh. <laughs> and that's just in the first year. That's strange. I mean, I know I'm just getting started, but I already feel like I'm in a better place. It's great. If you want to put yourself in a better place? Harris can help. With five helpful steps, like saving automatically, we help make money make sense. Major funding is also provided by Tuwani Foundation through a partnership with the Pritzker Military Library, the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation, United Healthcare, and the Walter E. Heller Foundation in memory of Alice DaCosta, with additional support from the Coleman Foundation and Ken Norgan, along with these generous supporters.